It's rivalry week, but is it really a rivalry if the Packers have won 16 of the last 21 matchups? Packers and Bears Sunday with the number one seed on the line. This is the illusion of complexity, boys and girls. Let's hit it. This team loves to win ugly. Winning ugly gets you to this point. Takes the snap on third down. Rodgers waits, throws, right side, got a man wide open. Touchdown, and it's Robert Tanyan again. Aaron Rodgers with his fourth touchdown of the game. It's going to be a good week for the Green Bay Packers. Getting a chance to move on. One more to go, we'll talk to you next week. One more indeed, one more to clinch the one seed in the NFC North and I can, or excuse me, the one seed in the NFC playoffs. And I can tell you, I am infinitely more annoyed at the Los Angeles Rams than I was before the kickoff of the Packers and Titans game because they are worthless and awful and Sean McVay is overrated, but we will get to that here momentarily. This is the illusion of complexity podcast. I'm your host. I am Jacob Westendorf live and in person in the game on Wisconsin studios you can follow me on Twitter at Jacob Westendorf, and you can follow all of us on Game On Wisconsin at Game On WI on Twitter. It is week 17. It is New Year's Eve as you are listening to this, the last day in the hell that has been 2020, hoping now that 2021 gives us some semblance of normalcy in the near future. And I am joined by my co hosts, my two favorite people in the world. Zachary Jacobson to my right here on the stream yard here, as you can see us here. Zach, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas? You know what, Jacob? I got a clean bill of health and I got my sanity. That's all I can ask for. And well, I, don't I, know about that. I got most of my sanity. <laughs> I got Say, about 30. whatever sanity you have is about to be gone here in the next hour. <laughs> You're right. Uh, I have 30% and by the end of the hour, I'll probably have about 14, 15%, but still regardless, clean bill of health. That's all I can ask for. And I'm sure hopefully I can say the same for you guys. Glad to be back here with both of you. That we have. And of course the queen of the show is here and perhaps the queen of Packers Twitter at this point, Aaron, Alice, Aaron joining us live from someplace that looks like the cabin in the woods. Uh, and I'm going to make that joke at least one more time before the end of the season, I hope, with a, a very nice jersey in the background. Uh, somebody who said he wanted to beat the piss out of the Chicago Bears, which I certainly love to hear. Aaron, did you get the kitten that I sent you for Christmas? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't. But um, I thought you were going to send your heart for sure. I was ready to smash it. But, you know, again, can't get everything that we want. Yeah. <laughs> It's like that scene from Wedding Crashers. I know that kitten you sent her. I don't know where it is because she didn't get it. And I know you're not raising that goddamn thing. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the show, guys. Packers thrash the Titans on Sunday night, 40 to 14, an absolute ass kicking of epic proportions. The best game the Packers have played in a while. I've, I don't know how long. I couldn't think of it. I was trying, I've tried since Sunday night to pin down when's the last time we saw that complete of a performance. Maybe last year against the Raiders. Uh, even then, the defense wasn't great mm -hmm. that time around. I was thinking maybe against Chicago in 2014 when they put up a 50 burger and only allowed 14 points. Oh, geez, you're but, going way back. Yeah, I mean, that's six years ago, right? I mean, it's been a long time. It's mm -hmm. and the best game of the Matt LaFleur era, no question about that. The best right. offense they've played to date. The defense answered every question. They shut down Derrick Henry. Zach, as you very astutely pointed out on the tweet machine, 48 of his 98 yards came after the score was 33 to 14. So before that, Packers held him to 15 carries for 50 yards. And Aaron, I actually want to give you the floor to that because Monday was very entertaining as I watched <laughs> you dunk on everybody. You looked like Michael Jordan and Scotty Pippen, actually Scotty Pippen against Patrick Ewing in the Eastern Conference playoffs, just yamming on Patrick Ewing's head for everybody that told you the Packers couldn't stop the run, and they sure as hell weren't stopping Patrick Ewing. So you have the floor. Please uh, let everybody know. <laughs> uh, it was so amazing. I was I was biting my tongue at halftime. I was like, I'm not going to talk shit at halftime, even though you know I feel really good about how we're playing because I wanted to see us play four quarters. 
And uh, yeah, I mean, what was it? Sunday, I just put out a tweet that said, like, I don't understand why everyone thinks that we're going to get our asses kicked. Like, I was like, I can understand if you think we might lose, but I just don't see why you're going to say that we're going to get blown out. Um, and I got a lot of responses. I got like nearly ratioed on it and uh, a lot of negativity and a lot of people basically insinuating that I'm an idiot, that I'm a moron. I don't know what I'm talking about. And then what do you know? Like it was, it was glorious. So everybody can, never mind. I won't finish that sentence. <laughs> GFY. Uh, uh, I, I am going to throw this out there because I did Monday morning after the game was over. I put out an apology thread for everybody <laughs> that for everyone that told me the Packers stood no chance against Derrick Henry. They couldn't stop him and they sure as hell weren't going to stop the Titans. I do appreciate everyone's accountability. And those of you that did reach out, I did say I also accepted cash. Uh, I did not get any cash, but that's unfortunate, but we're going to move on because the Titans are done. The Packers have laid them to waste and move into now a really big game, honestly, and a game that we didn't know how big it was going to be, you know, five weeks ago when the Packers destroyed Chicago at Lambeau field. It was a game we looked at that maybe Chicago would have nothing to play for to the bears credit. They've won every game they've played since then and are now in position to make the playoffs with a win. And this is a big game for green Bay, new Orleans faces, Carolina, Seattle faces a undermanned San Francisco 49ers team. If green Bay wins, they are the one seed in the NFC North or in the, I keep saying NFC North. They'll be the one seed in the NFC North regardless. That's wrapped up. They are the one seed in the NFC. If they lose this game, New Orleans is favored to beat Carolina. Seattle is obviously favored to beat San Francisco. If those two results go by chalk where those two teams win, Green Bay will drop to the three seed and have potential to play Chicago again the next week because the Bears have a pretty good chance of jumping to the six seed if they do, in fact, win on Sunday. And I am telling you the last thing that you want to see is not only Green Bay blowing a chance at the one seed, but then having to face the same team with a world of confidence coming in maybe six days later on a short week in a playoff game. The The ramifications of this game are massive. Think about it this way. If Green Bay wins on Sunday, one seed, every game is at home. You have to win two games to get to the Super Bowl at home. You lose that game, you drop to the three seed, you get a home game, and then you're very likely now to have to play two road games to get to the Super Bowl, and they're very likely to be in Seattle and in New Orleans, two very historically tough places to play. I cannot emphasize enough how important this game is for the Packers to win. The good news is they are the better team, and they should have an opportunity to win this game. Where I want to start is the big news that we got around 4 o'clock Central Time uh, yesterday, and that is the Packers have added – a, a new defensive lineman to their roster. And I don't have the hot key that I was able to make, but think of the Billy Madison voice and tell Brian Gutekunst, snack packs, you're the coolest. Damon Harrison, better known as snacks is set to become a green Bay Packer. They claimed him off of waivers. And it, according to Matt Schneidman, his sources say that Harrison does plan to report to green Bay. And that's no small news because interest from the Packers has never been an issue for Damon Harrison. They offered him a big contract. Or, well, the biggest contract this offseason, he didn't come. They had him scheduled for a visit, and he chose Seattle instead. Harrison is set to come to Green Bay, it sounds like, according to Schneidman, assuming there isn't a change of heart. So I'm going to start with you, Aaron. What does this mean for this Packers defense? Is it a big deal? Is it a little deal? What do you think this could mean for this Green Bay defense? He is eligible to play Sunday. How much he plays, we'll see if at all. Uh, but going into the postseason as well. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, I, I don't think it's as, as big of a deal as I think I thought it would be in the offseason. I mean, there's a reason that Seattle was not playing him. Um, you know, I mean, he he's he's a good body, but I mean, I don't, you don't want to expect like any sort of Kenny Clark. Um, I wouldn't expect any sort of Kenny Clark numbers out of him. So I think it's just an above average body. And especially, I mean, Kiki's on the injury report with a concussion and he didn't practice today or well, today's Wednesday, but he wasn't practicing. So, I mean, if we can get him in on Sunday, that would be actually kind of nice to have, you know, 
uh, him potentially be in there, but obviously we're really thin in interior in the interior. So it's really nice to have just another body. So, and he's that, cheap, real cheap. <laughs> that he will. I'll say this. Ben Fennel pointed out today on Sunday, Tyler Lancaster played 20 snaps. Brian price played nine, put that together. He played about 40 snaps recently, uh, in Seattle when he was playing, that's about what you're looking for. Uh, he's mm -hmm. not going to come in. He's not going to change the trajectory of this defense. You know, what you want to see is still Kenny Clark, obviously getting the majority of the reps and Kingsley Kiki getting the majority of the pass rush reps, if that's something they're going to do, but he can play over, you know, on rundowns. He can even spell Kenny Clark and get him off the field on some rundowns and potentially give the Packers a boost that way by keeping Kenny Clark fresh. So I look forward to seeing if that's something he can do again. I, it could be one of those like little moves like Howard green, but this is a little bit bigger of a name than Howard green. This is like Howard green on steroids, human growth hormone and super Saiyan mode all the way together. And hopefully getting this Packers run defense, which has been much improved. I, I wrote the article for game on after the Panthers game, the Packers were allowing a very nice 69 yards per game to opposing teams, leading rushers after the Carolina game. Uh, I haven't done the math since then, but Derrick Henry's numbers aren't going to change that all that much after Sunday's game. The Packers run defense has improved dramatically since the disaster against Dalvin cook. And that's something that the question now of, you know, what is their Achilles heel going to be going into December? I'm sure you're still going to hear a lot about their rush defense. You know, they still are going to average, you know, giving up four and a half yards of carry, all that stuff is going to come to light at some point. But Green Bay, I think, showed on Sunday they can win any type of game. And now what Snacks can do is in one of those games where if the games are at Lambeau and it's going to be windy and blustery and nasty, and it's going to be one of those games where both teams have to run it 60% of the time. Now Green Bay, I think, has a chance to control those running games even more because he still has that ability to help you in that running game. So I look forward to seeing what he can add to this team. And I, you know, I think a, a motivated veteran like that chasing a championship could certainly be something that gives this defensive line a boost. Zach, what do you think about the addition of senior snacks? Well, see, I, I see everyone even on Twitter and pretty much everywhere. They're all pointing towards that Howard Green signing, you know, a, a while back and how that really kind of boosted their path to the Super Bowl. I don't think it's going to be that significant. And I know everyone's just really relieved to see finally the Packers land snacks. They wanted him in the offseason as, you know, our buddy Ross Uglin, the Packer report, as he as he kind of appointed to and he reported. They tried to poach him off the Seahawks practice squad. You know, before they activ activated him to the roster, they've won him for a while, and now they finally have him. So it's it's definitely relieving at this point. But given how the Packers, you know, their pass rush has been playing, their defensive line, they've been they've been really good the last few weeks. That you know that the pass rush just in general, they have nine, uh, 19 sacks in their last 20 quarters of football. You know that the you know Kingsley Kiki has been playing well. Dean Lowry's made a made a jump. Tyler Lancaster's been giving them some good snaps. So uh, you know. What what uh, snacks is going to bring you? He's going to bring you just a veteran guy who can come in and immediately play for you. He's not. There's not going to be like a learning curve or anything. He's been there. He's done that. He can come in, step in right away, and produce. You know, so I wouldn't be surprised if you know he plays as, as soon as this, this week, assuming he passes you know COVID protocols. I don't know how long that whole process is, is going to take, but you know he's going to be able to get right onto the field for you. And like you said, he's going to be able to relieve Kenny Clark, get him off the field, keep him fresh. You know, especially going into into a postseason run. So I just, I, I think it, it's a big signing in the sense that it'll be, it'll just give them defensive line depth and some of the best teams in football. I mean, I go back to the 2017 Eagles. It's the best teams in football, deep defensive lines, being able to, to consistently reshuffle those trenches and keep guys fresh. That's, that's important, you know? And the thing is with their pass rush right now too, they're getting, they're getting help from across the board. I mean, Darnell Savage was a huge part in stopping uh, uh, um, Derrick Henry. I mean, with the way he was able to come down, crash down towards the ball from his safety spot on the back end, just watching the film, that was a huge part. Preston Smith set the edge on the first play of the game. He disengaged from the block and stopped Derrick Henry, held him for, I think it was no gain. The Packers, they didn't, Derrick Henry's longest run up until like the last two minutes of the first half was five yards. So 
they did an amazing job against Derrick Henry. They've done an amazing job against the run the past few weeks. So, you know, my opinion on this run defense wouldn't have changed without snacks. And, you know, it doesn't change with him. I think they would have been just fine going into the playoffs right now with or without him. But knowing what this, the biggest weakness on this team was at the beginning of the year in that NFC championship game against Raheem Mostert, adding him definitely doesn't hurt. Yeah, I think it changes the ceiling, at least, of where this run defense could be. Now, how quickly can they get him acclimated? This is something that maybe they can get him ready, you know, through the bye. Because uh, they've, I mean, you've seen they've added guys the last couple of weeks. You know, they added Anthony Rush a couple of weeks ago. He's played all of one snap, and I'm sure it was impactful and legendary. And we'll talk about it on the Super Bowl video at the end of the season. Brian Price was activated last week. He played nine snaps. Uh, they've kind of shuffled through. You know, Kenny Clark has played a vast majority of snaps. After that, it's been Dean Lowry, Kingsley Kiki kind of rotating through. And Dean Lowry, I think, is somebody who's elevated his level of play, especially towards the latter half of the season. Uh, as we've gotten through things here, his play as, as they've decreased his snaps, he's actually gotten better. And that's probably one of those reasons why you're talking about Zach. He's somebody who's fresh, but now I think, you know, Kenny Clark right now, he played 83% of the snaps and he's usually somewhere around that, you know, 80% mark for most of the games that he is active in. If you can get that closer to, you know, 75, maybe the lower seventies, that's somebody who can be fresh towards the end of the games and when they're ready for him to get after the passer, which this pass rush has certainly ramped up in recent weeks with Rashawn Gary playing really well. He was a one man wrecking crew on Sunday night against Tennessee. You have Zadarius Smith, who's an all pro player and Preston Smith, who you mentioned he's elevated his level of play as well. Really since being the Packers can call it whatever they want, but he was benched for that first series of the game against well maybe not the first series i guess he came in a couple plays later but for that first bit he wasn't a starter against chicago at the end of the month and he has played much better of late as well and that's what i want to get into now is this packers defense since december they're allowing 16 points per game if you take away that ridiculous punt return by jalen rager from the philadelphia eagles the defense is questioned all the time you know, national media says all the time, my hesitancy to pick the Packers to go to the Super Bowl is a leaky defense. Sometimes they bring up the weapons and all that sort of stuff, but most of the time they're talking about the defense. They've played better. And you can make a pretty good argument, in my opinion, that the defense has actually been better since December 6th against the Eagles than the offense has. And that's actually saying something, especially considering the level of opponent that they played on Sunday night. They complete That was the number one scoring offense in football going into Sunday night completely shut him down just complete destruction of an offense that was supposed to be able to just run rampant through them both in the run and the passing game they got to, they're getting turnovers they're getting sacks and they're playing sound they're not reliant upon those things either they're forcing teams to punt they're forcing teams to be uncomfortable which i think is something they weren't doing earlier in the season zach what i want to know off of that to what do you attribute the majority of this team's success since the calendar turn. And you really, you can include that last game against Chicago too, if you really want to, because once the game was 41 to 10 for all intents and purposes, they basically quit playing on that side of the ball, but it was 41 to 10 at one point too. So what do you attribute the success of this defense for the last five, six weeks? Well, they're not only getting individual jumps for, from guys, but I think it starts with just that safety tandem back there with Adrian Amos and Darnell Savage. They've both, not just individually, but as a pair, granted they've both been doing different things, but when your safety start playing well, everything around you falls into place. Your defense just becomes immediately that much more formidable. You know, your your linebackers can start playing, you know, in various spots. They can start playing more confidently knowing that on the back end, everything's more secure. Your corners can start you know, playing confidently because you don't have to worry about getting getting beat by the deep ball. You can trust your safeties. Your safeties can come down in the box like Darnell Savage has been doing. So, I I think it it just it all starts with their safeties. And I mean, even uh, um uh, against against the Titans, you know, even for example, they're also doing things to take away certain opponents' strength. So against the Titans, my biggest key to that game was. To build up a lead, your offense being your best defense. 
That's what they did. They went up 13 nothing, and it forced the Titans to stray, stray away from that running game, that Derrick Henry, that play-action game. And eventually, that was when the Titans kind of became one-dimensional. And Ben and Fennell uh, actually noted that on Open Book on Wednesday. It forced the Titans to become that, that drop-back-to-pass type of team. You know, that's their play action was their strength. That's not something they're accustomed to. So when they're forced to play from behind like that, kind of everything is just going to fall apart. And that's pretty much what happened. So they're getting jumps from from groups, individual players, and they're taking away the strengths of their opponents. That's there, and I don't think you can overstate. Aaron, you had a tweet, and I swear sometimes it's like we're reading each other's minds, but something along the lines of, I think you said Darnell Savage looks like Jair or something. I don't remember the exact word. Yeah, I called him Jair Savage. Yeah, there we go. And then Sunday night, I tweeted that the ascension from Savage from November 4th against San Francisco until now is reminiscent of Jair's jump from last season. The difference is Jair is, or excuse me, Savage is making the splash plays. And Jair was dropping those last season. So it looks even more sexy to the eyes, basically, because Savage has those plays. And really, Sunday night, he dropped a pick six and was like a step away from a third interception. It was that close to, I mean, he was, if he catches the pick six, he's the NFC Defensive Player of the Week. If he catches both interceptions, he's probably the NFC Defensive Player of the Month. And he may still very well end up being that, anyways. He has been incredible. I don't think you can overstate that. And the Packers have raved about this kid since he got into camp. Obviously I've made no bones about it. I was one of the biggest members of his fan club since he came in and Adrian Amos is rock solid. I will absolutely, I was not a fan of that signing when they made it. I will very much eat crow on that. He has been a fantastic addition to this defense from a play standpoint, a leadership standpoint, everything he's everything you could want on this defense and he has a chance at a bit of a revenge game. The last time he played in Chicago, uh, he had a game winner. So that was obviously a nice thing to see as well. I think you're getting Maggie Loney said this to me and I think it was appropriate. You're getting complimentary football, which is something that the Packers defense did really well in 2010. You had games in 2010 where Clay Matthews and Colin Jenkins and BJ Raji just terrorized the quarterback and they just ruined games that way. And then you had other games where it was Charles Woodson and Sam Shields and Nick Collins and guys like that completely shutting down. And forgive me, I I didn't say Tremont Williams. I forgot maybe the best corner on the team that year, but shutting down everything on the back end. And they were able to do that. The Packers are able to do that this year too. And on Sunday night, I think you saw both. Coverage was good. That led to some plays and coverage. You have an all-pro pass rusher like Zadarius Smith. You have an ascending player like Rashawn Gary. You have a player who's a veteran and playing better like Preston Smith. You have Kenny Clark. Kingsley Kiki's played better. Chris Barnes has been a find in the middle of the last two weeks if he can continue this level of play. This defense looks to be one that is a championship-level unit, and that's something the Packers have not had. You know, We've always said, as long as you have 12 and this offense, you just need the defense to be good enough. Well, now... It's possible the defense is not only good enough, but maybe if they play like that, good to win a game that Green Bay's offense doesn't play particularly well, like they did against Carolina, for example, just eight days prior. And that is what I think is the most exciting because it's rare in the playoffs where the offense just rolls all the way through. Now, I know Kansas City last year scored 30 in every game, but That Super Bowl, the defense did have to keep them in the game while San Francisco had them stymied for a while. So maybe Green Bay will have to do that this year if and when they get into a situation like that. Aaron, what do you think is the biggest part of this Packers defense and the way they've played over the last month? I am going to kind of piggyback on what you said, but everything being complimentary, everything's working together because it was so it was really frustrating at the beginning of the year because obviously you know Jair was playing really well and Kevin King was playing pretty well to start the season he's been kind of a question mark the past few weeks but and but the pass rush wasn't there so it felt like the the defense just wasn't cohesive enough and and that's what's starting to happen now is everything is working and I just don't know how you how you can get around it and put up 30 points because you're going to need 30 points against this offense. So, I mean, you've got the pass rush that's 
like being really dominant the last month or so. And you've got Amos and Savage, which are, which are becoming like the best, you know, safety duo in the, duo in the league, arguably. And then you've got, you know, Jair and Kevin King that are, you know, on the corners. So I just, what I mean, I don't know what you do. It It's tough. And um, yeah, so I'm just going to agree with you when you say everything being complimentary. I think that that has, has been lacking. It seems like when one part of the defense isn't working, the other part is. It's been like almost the entire team. It's like when the defense has been doing well, the offense hasn't been doing well. But this past week, both were on fire. And it's been a long time since I feel like we've seen both of those working in tandem like that. And I do want to say this. Kudos to Mike Patton. Because Mm -hmm. I've said this before. If Mike Patton burps in private, Packers fans want him fired. So I think he deserves credit for what he's done with this defense over the last month. Obviously I I've always been a proponent of Jimmy's and Joe's not X's and O's. And I think the players playing better is the biggest reason for that. But I also think that, you know, the conversation with Zadarius Smith and Preston Smith and the guys where he just said to simplify some things, he's done that. And I don't understand. Well, I do understand because it's Twitter, but the obsession that we have with everybody still talking about, defensive coordinator candidates for when he gets fired. Let me give you guys a news flash. If the defense plays like this and the Packers win the Super Bowl, but one, why the fuck do you care if he gets fired if we win the Super Bowl? Two, he's not getting fired if they win the Super Bowl. Teams that win Super Bowls don't usually fire coordinators. I will be very surprised if that's something that happens. And they probably shouldn't. If they if he if the defense plays this well from December until beating Patrick Mahomes or Josh Allen in the Super Bowl, he deserves to keep his job. And I'm not going to say have a street named after him in Green Bay, but I mean, honestly, that's a hell of a job from, you know, the beginning to the end of the season with how well this defense has played really since the disaster in Indianapolis, which honestly, the defense didn't play all that poorly. They just had a couple lapses and the offense put them in some bad positions by going three and out and turning the ball over. So this is something you could kind of see coming over a period of weeks. It's just, it's funny to me how narratives shape how we think about things, but that's the world we live in guys. The bears play this weekend against the Packers, the quarterback history. I'm not sure if you guys have heard, but they drafted Mitchell Trubisky instead of Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson. And I don't know if that's ever been pointed out, but in case, sure? it, in case it hasn't, I wanted to point it out, especially for our good friend, Mr. Lama, who is not here tonight. He wanted to join us, but he's ducking us. Um, that's just how it is. Sorry, Lama, but you ducked and you know what you're doing, but that's just how it is. If they play for the NFC championship or something, you have no choice. You're coming on this show again, um, but they did. So I wanted to go through, you have to marry one and you have to fuck one and you have to kill one for some iconic Bears quarterbacks in our lifetime. And they are smoking Jay Cutler, sexy Rexy Grossman, and the neckbeard Kyle Orton. And Aaron, we will start with you. Okay. So I had to think about this. Okay. So I don't, I'm trying to, you know, Jay Cutler has just a place in my heart. He's been so good to the Packers. You know, I'm going to marry him. Partially, he's had the longevity and, you know, that the other, he's played longer. So I guess, you know, that is, he's faithful. I don't know. Or loyal, loyal. We'll say loyal. So I'm going to marry Jay Cutler. He also makes me laugh. Um, And I'm going to fuck Rex Grossman. um, Because I think of, you know, a one-nighter, one-night stand. He took him to a Super Bowl. So one Super Bowl, so we'll go with that. And so um, that just leaves Kyle Orton that I'm killing. Um, I'm not a neckbeard person, so get that the hell out. Zachary? Well, I am going to marry Rex Grossman for nostalgic purposes. <laughs> Growing up and playing Madden on the PS2 and always Packers versus Bears and stuff, he was always the quarterback of the Bears. Um, and because I remember that 2016 or that 2006 season where um, Bears went to the Super Bowl and it was it was Rex. What were you like nine? 
Jacob, I've been a Packer fan since I was four years old. I've been following. So this I, game. But I mean, I've been following this game for, since I was a kid, man. He would have been. Nope. Yeah, nope. he would have been like ten. I wasn't. No. What 11. year were you born? I was born in '95. Yeah, so eleven. But what? Wait, what? What month is your birthday in though? Valentine's Day, February. Oh. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Like you know my birthday. The two people um, I brought, I recruited for this show are fake as hell. What a surprise! When's my birthday then? So, anyways, I'm gonna continue answering the question. <laughs> <laughs> And my fifth, my fifth grade teacher, who I had a huge crush on the year before, she was a Bears fan. And she was from Chicago, so I remember both of those things. Uh, so, anyways, and I'm also going to, I'm gonna fuck Jay Cutler, just because the Packers, they always, they always fucked him. So return the favor. <laughs> um, and then I'm killing, I'm killing Kyle Orton. I remember him more as as a Bronco than a Bear. So I mean. Than a bear. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I remember when the Bears traded Kyle Orton to get Jay Cutler. And I remember exactly where I was when it happened because I was still in high school and everybody at my school said, Oh, you guys are screwed now. Favre retired. We got Jay Cutler. And I immediately said, Our quarterback is still better. And I had never seen Aaron Rodgers play really to that point. But I was like, I am so confident he's going to be better. And of course, they played each other to open that 2009 season. And I was like, yep, Aaron's better. And then they won opening night. And I was like, bingo, bango. There you 21 go. 21 to 15. 21, Aaron Rodgers after he, uh, that whole Izzy Clutch thing. That was the narrative all offseason. And he hits Greg Jennings, the fourth best receiver to ever play with Aaron Rodgers. Okay. You know, Jacob, just you got to shut your mouth sometimes. You know that? Hang on. It's third. I'm, I lied. It's third. Talking out of his ass. L- let, me, let me guess. It's Devontae, Jordy, and then Greg? Yeah. I mean, that's fair. I'm gonna, you know, that's. Devontae's one with a bullet. Like, I mean, there is no argument. The only people that are arguing for Jordy are like Jordy fanboys and his family. That's it. Yeah. Well, I I mean, I said on, I said on open book, I mean, like going, coming into this season, it was for me, it was still Greg Jennings at number one, Devontae at two, and then Jordy three, as far as who Rogers has played. But now it's like, it's Devontae, like without question. Like he moved ahead. Are we talking, are we talking individual skills or like chemistry? Because, because that I think Jordy would be ahead of Greg Jennings for me just because of their chemistry. But if we're talking the best skilled receiver, I think Greg Jennings is higher than Jordy. See, I think Jordy gets like docked points because people like attribute all of his success to that mythical chemistry thing. But I think he watched Jordy do a double move. That was not because of Aaron Rodgers and chemistry. That was because he was nasty. Right, but but it's the same kind of thing with um like a trust thing. Yeah. And, oh yeah. And, you know, like he, he could throw it to Jordy and know that he'd catch it. And I feel like he had more of that with Jordy than Greg. I mean, well, Greg, see, they, they never had Greg and Aaron. They never had chemistry. Like a lot not of like right. that. Not like right, that. That's why right. I'm saying like. Right, there, was, there was a connection, but there was never like that, that same brain type of thing. A I don't lot know, of man. They had, I mean, it takes a lot of trust to thread the needle on a seam ball in the Super Bowl the way that he right. did for that. But a lot of a lot of their accomplishments together were just based off of pure skill, talent. Greg being the player that he was, he was. I will was, say this: I'm I'm okay with giving Jennings extra points for being the best receiver on the Super Bowl team. Like I completely understand that. Not the point of the show. We can certainly have this debate in the off season because there will be plenty of yeah, room. We, we went off, discussion. but I think we can all very much easily agree that <clears throat> agree. Excuse me. None of those guys ever had an argument a good one at least for the best receiver in football. And Devonte Adams has the argument. He is the best receiver in football right now. Mm-hmm. I am going to go with the same order as Aaron. So I'm going to marry Jay Cutler because I love him. And I, first of all, he's the fourth best quarterback in the history of the Packers, which deserves a title in and of itself. He's hilarious. The smoking J memes are fantastic. And one of my favorite stories, friend of the show, Ivan Carter, uh, at Ivan Carter 9, he's a Vikings fan, said he once saw Jay Cutler on the street and somebody was like, oh, Jay, man, I saw you. I know you. I went to Vanderbilt too. And he was in his car and he basically like had his window rolled down as this guy was saying this. And Jay just goes, I don't care and rolled his window up and drove away, which is like quintessential Jay. 
And part of me that like, that's not surprising at all. <laughs> no. And something I appreciate about Jay is like, he is unapologetically himself. And I think he got a lot of flack and a lot of bullshit for like acting like he didn't care, which is like, that's just who he was. Like he just kind of looked nonchalant, you know, that's just right. And he won the league. So give him bonus points for that. Right. The little cutlet, which is yeah. fantastic. And you know, his show was funny when he was on it with, I don't even remember his ex-wife's name, Kristen Cavallari. Um, you know, that was funny for a little while. And just some of the, one of my favorite things is when he retired, because this is a legitimate discussion I've had with my wife before when his wife, Kristen asked him like, Jay, what do you want to do now that you're retired? He goes, nothing. That was literally the point of me retiring. Not only that, but like him coming out of retirement to play with the dolphins to basically <laughs> throw some YOLO balls and make like $15 million. Like that's fantastic. Jay Cutler is a true American icon that was not appreciated nearly enough while he was in the NFL. And I miss watching him play. Uh, I am going to have relations with Rex Grossman because he's so unpredictable. You just never know what you're going to get. So you never want to fully commit to him. I remember watching him in that Super Bowl against the Colts and that season for him was so up and down, you know, when he was great at the beginning of the season and the bears went like five and O or something like that to start the year. And then he kind of went down and then he was back up. And then in the Super Bowl, he was just awful. And I remember that whole week. So I went in high school. I was a freshman that year. And everybody at my school is fired up because the Bears are in the Super Bowl and we're going to beat Peyton Manning. And I'm like, there is no way Rex Grossman is beating Peyton Manning. Peyton Manning just beat Tom Brady in a playoff game for the first time ever. He is not following that up by losing to Rex Grossman in the Super Bowl. Sure enough, he didn't. Grossman kicked the ball all over the field, but there were times he had some nice plays. So he'd be good for, you know, a one timer kind of thing. And I'm going to kill Kyle Orton because I was in Kansas city when Kyle Orton was the starting quarterback for the chiefs and ended the Packers perfect season. So I kind of feel like I owe him one for that. And his neck beard is just disgusting. Like when people do no shave November and you don't shave your neck beard, you're a filthy, disgusting animal and you deserve the worst things to happen to you when that happens. So Kyle Orton made a thing out of that and he is gross and awful and horrible for that. So wherever Kyle Orton is and he, him being bad at football made Tim Tebow a thing, which in turn made skip Bayless a thing. So Kyle Orton is skip ba or skip Bayless is Kyle Orton's fault. Fuck that guy, but kill him. in for the sake of this segment, it was, it was Grossman. That was the quarterback when the bears shut out the Packers and McCarthy's debut wasn't it it right. wasn't that, was that season yeah in that was their super bowl season right. 26 McCarthy, i remember that i remember that game too it was like i walk i remember looking over at my dad and being like is this what this is like because to that <laughs> point the packers had never been shit and i was like is this what this is like like we suck and there is no hope for this team coming off of four and twelve bad <laughs> right into that bad <laughs> Yeah, And then the game ended with Devin Hester returning a punt for a touchdown to make it 26 zip. It was rough. Packers ended that season, obviously, like you mentioned, Zach, with a, a big win over Chicago to. And, yep. In Chicago finished eight them, and eight. Get them to eight and eight. Yeah. I so remember, that was, I, I think I remember far. I think he cried. I remember on, it was on Sunday night several times. Yeah. He was going to retire. Yeah. I kind of wish he had. Oh, it all worked out. It all worked out. It, no, because if he if he did at that moment, then it would have it would have uh, never made that 2007 season happen. And as as bad as it ended, it was like one of my favorite seasons growing it up. It would have saved me one of the worst days of my life. Bummer. Okay, yeah, but you're telling me you didn't enjoy that season. I did. It was oh, a nice yeah. little renaissance. It was. It really was. It was. I remember. Uh, yeah, I remember that year. Here's I, that was a year I remember. I thought the Packers were going to the Super Bowl. And I don't know if you guys are like I am, but I look for like signs to see if Green Bay is going to the Super Bowl or just for something like that. So that year it was Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers were playing the halftime show. And obviously they're one of their most famous songs is Running Down a Dream. And I was like, that's it. It's Green Bay. They're running down Brett Favre's last dream to ride off into the sunset a Super Bowl champion. Wow, that's so pathetic. I was 16. Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. I'm not laughing so at you. <laughs> Guys, the Bears offense has been much better of late. They'll get Akeem Hicks back. This is not a rollover game. Chicago is a quality opponent or as much as possible. Are you I basically want to ask, you know, Aaron, are you buying this Bears team as a team that's, you know, 
what are they? This team has kind of has been as Jekyll Hyde as possible. They were five and one, then they lost six straight. Now they've won three in a row to get to where they're at, at eight and seven with a chance to get to the playoffs. Are you buying this team or, you know, are they more that team that lost six straight? Um, I mean, somewhere in the middle. I, I mean, I think the biggest difference of uh, what's happening is they're really playing to Trubisky's strengths now. And the offensive line has been better. Uh, so their run game is starting to develop. They're really improving in that regard, but they still don't scare me. Um, to me, their scheme reminds me a lot more of the Titans, but like, like less. It, but it's not just as good that, players, right? Yeah, I can't that. Yeah, like that's. The, so I feel like after this past week's performance, there's just no way. Um, I mean, their defense is better, obviously, but uh, I. Our no defense scares me with our offense, really. Um, but I, I'm still not worried. I, I mean, they don't they don't scare me. Um, Mr. Trubisky doesn't scare me. I mean, he's bare. I don't think he's like made like he's made had one pass over 20 yards. Like he he's not a, a big threat in my opinion. Um, as long as you know we just kind of play like we did this past Sunday and we'll squash them. I'm right there with you. I think, you know, I think they're a better team than the one that came to Lambeau field. Obviously Trubisky's playing more confident. He's playing better. The offensive line is playing better. They found a bit of an identity with David Montgomery. My thing with this bears team is if you're going to beat Aaron Rodgers and the Packers, you're going to have to go score for score with them. And mm -hmm. I don't think this bears defense, even as much respect as I have for them. And I did the first time they played as well. They can't, you can't hold them down. For that, I mean, the Packers' worst games offensively this year, save for the Bucks game, were they scored 24, 28 kind of points. And I just think even if Green Bay does that, I think their defense can hold Chicago down to that point too. And the, I mean, if you look at, and granted, I know, you know, my, my new favorite saying is the Devontae Adams one, I can only eat what's in front of me, and the Bears have only eaten what's in front of them. But the, the teams they've beaten, Detroit, Jacksonville, and Minnesota – okay. Like that matters. Obviously they won the games, but this is a different level. This is the best team in the NFC and they're going to have to play a different level of football to win that kind of game. I just don't think they can match the Packers score for score that way. So I buy their offense to a degree, but I think in order to beat green Bay, they're going to have to win like a 24 to 21, 21, 17 kind of game. And I just really struggle to see the Packers, being held to that low of point total in a game that Aaron Rodgers starts and finishes unless Khalil Mack just completely has Billy Turner revert to 2019 late season, Billy Turner form kind of thing, which he's certainly capable of, but Billy Turner kind of handled Khalil Mack the last time around. Now they do get Akeem Hicks back for this matchup. That certainly matters, but I, I just don't see it. You know, the bears are missing potentially two of their corners, Jalen Johnson and Buster screen were both DNPs today. We'll see if they're able to suit up and go on Sunday, but I just struggle to see them being able to slow this team down and their offense. I don't think can keep up it even as well as they have played in recent weeks. Zach, are you, are you buying this bears team? What are your thoughts, you know, over the last couple of weeks? No, they suck. <laughs> Still <laughs> suck. They lost six straight games. Their their little three game win streak is adorable and all, but it's still a team quarterback by Mitchell Trubisky. You don't know what you're going to get from him. He's 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 sporadic as hell. Even in the, in this three game win streak, he hasn't been like he hasn't like changed the world or anything. He hasn't been fantastic. Okay, so and like you said, Jacob, they have to go score for score with the Packers. This this a team who has been the best offense in football for a good while now, for a few weeks now. And I just, I, I can't see them doing that. You know, the, the, the best thing they could do or hope to do is now with Akeem Hicks back, granted he was, he didn't practice on Wednesday because he has an illness. So obviously that's something worth monitoring, but, and he missed that first matchup against the bears, but assuming he's back and they do have really good linebackers, I've, said that multiple times this year and especially you know going into the first Bears game they have really good linebackers so the best thing that they can hope to do is to kind of stifle the Packers running game and that's that alone is going to be a challenge I know the Packers their confidence is riding high I mean they're coming off of what 230 something rushing yards against against you know 
the Titans last week and, you know, a bunch the week before against the Panthers. So they're getting everything they want on the ground right now. And that in turn is opening up the passing game, you know, which some we've talked about all year, but if the bears can't do that and kind of really force Aaron Rodgers to be one dimensional, which if you force him to do that, I mean, that doesn't even guarantee you a win. you force Aaron Rodgers to be one dimensional, that's not exactly guaranteeing you a freaking win. It's Aaron, it's Aaron fucking Rodgers. So, I mean, that's like their best shot at winning. And for the Packers defensively, I mean, you got to take advantage of that offensive line that, yeah, you know, last couple of weeks they've been okay, but for the majority of the season, they haven't been able to protect, uh, you know, whether it's Mitchell Trubisky, whether it was Nick Foles coming in, they haven't been able to, to protect the quarterback. So they've been very bad. And the Packers pass rush, like I mentioned earlier, 19 sacks in their last five games, that's going to be big. So hopefully they can continue kind of amping that up, take advantage of that, of that matchup in front of you. So, yeah, no, I mean, nothing really about, not even just the offense, but this team in general, I think, should really be scaring anybody. Of course, their morale, their confidence is going to be riding high. They have something to play for, their playoff lives. It's it's going to be it's gonna be fun. I think it'll be closer than people expect, though. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I think this Bears team, obviously, is playing for something. They could be playing for a lot of things, not just their playoff lives, the life of their head coach, potentially. If Peter Bukowski pointed this out on Locked on Packers, that... Uh, the you know the Bears opened their tenure with Matt Nagy with a embarrassing loss to the Packers where they led twenty to nothing. I don't know if you guys saw that, but the Packers once trailed twenty to nothing at Lambeau Field against the Bears, and the Packers actually came back and won that game. And the quarterback had one leg. Um, it's Randall Cobb again. It was and indeed it was Randall Cobb again. That poor kid. Actually, I would feel bad. Well, he's young, so I still feel bad for him. He's too young to know any better. At this point, he actually might be old enough to know better. I don't know. Any poor kid. You're, that, you're smart ass. Did you any, watch the full clip of that? No, I never have. Right, yeah, he's like, so who said we're losing this game? He's well, I've seen that part, but I've never watched the whole thing. Well, he's like 10, of course. I was a little dick. I'm a little I dick see, now. I but, video come up on the timeline every time we, we play the Bears, and it's just, I never watch it, just for the record. <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. I enjoy I watching. The, Watch I enjoy watching break. the range of emotions of yeah, like oh my god, we're gonna win. So like it's gone, done. Good night. Mm-hmm. Thanks for playing, guys. Um, no, I'm with you. I think that. And then Matt Nagy, obviously, if the Packers win, like say they finish off a 41 to 10 kind of game, the Bears have said before one of the things that endeared Lovey Smith to this fan base and the ownership group was when he said our number one goal, and I'll never forget this because it totally embodies the Chicago Bears and their baby brother attitude that they have towards the Packers. For example, Mike McCarthy gets hired as the head coach of the Packers. Matt LaFleur gets hired as the coach of the Packers. One of the first things they say, our goal is to win championships. Lovey Smith says our number one goal is to beat the Green Bay Packers. There you go. They value this rivalry so much in Chicago. And I completely understand that obviously beating your rivals and your division teams is important, but it should not be your number one goal to beat the rival team. The goal is to win championships. It's why I hate that whole, and there are plenty of fans around here and there are Packer fans that do it too. I know that, but it feels like there are more bear fans, maybe because I live around more of them that say, oh, I don't care if we go 2-14 and as long as the two are against Green Bay. Like, yes, you do. You should care. (laughs) You should care if your team goes 2-14, and regardless of who goes 2. See, I I was told that Jimmy Graham specifically wanted to play for Chicago because they want to win a championship. Yeah, they're fighting to get into the playoffs, and look who's fighting to get the number one seed. And they're better because you're not here. Sorry, Jimmy, but it's true. Anyways, they're, they've got that desperation fact. They could be playing for the life of their head coach. Some of them could be playing for jobs, obviously, uh, with the you know the cap situation being what it is. Speaking of, sidebar, can we stop talking about next year's salary cap? We have no idea what that number is going to be. We shouldn't be projecting what the cap looks like until we know what the number is. Projecting who will and won't be here with, it's just a guess. That's all it is at this point is guesswork. So please stop. Side rant over. I think that this game will probably be, I mean, it's not going to be 41 to 10 at any point. I would totally take it if it was, but something that I had pointed out to me again by Maggie was that last year, the Packers played in week 17. They had a number two seed and a buy on the line and they came out and if they play any team other than the Detroit lions, they probably lose. And they played horrible from start to finish. And this year, I think they know, and that that is an experience that might help them that come out, 
take care of your business and get the hell out of Dodge. You are a 32 minute plane ride, 60 minutes of good football away from never having to leave Lambeau field again, get it done. It's that simple. You guys come here for our hard hitting and heavy hitting analysis guys. Let's move to our heavy hitter segment. It's Chicago this week. So we wanted to ask about Chicago style pizza and pizza preferences. So I did this once with Perry Goldstein and I said uh, that Chicago pizza was superior to New York style pizza and the look on her face, I swear if looks could kill, she would have killed me. I didn't realize it was that serious, but apparently it was. Uh, Zach, what are your thoughts on Chicago style pizza? Well, you see my mom's side of the family is from New York. So I gotta agree with Perry. I mean, even then I don't like Chicago style pizza deep dish, whatever the hell you want to call it. First of all, it looks like soup. It does <laughs> not. I told you, Aaron, before the show, and you said, yeah, well, it's better compared to a casserole. That's an actual reenactment, by the way. I sound just like that. I sound just like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm contractually obligated to fight you, Zach. It's okay. Jake, I can fight you. Yeah, yeah. Look, I will say this. I would be more willing to try. I, well, I've tried deep dish, but I've never had Chicago style deep dish. For as bad as it looks and as bad as I think it is, I would be more willing to try it than I would be willing to try pineapple on pizza. No, well, pineapple on pizza is a fucking disaster. So that's not even a discussion. See, I agree. And trust me, like that was my brand on Twitter for the longest fucking time. I would, I would not like, I, I am, I'm known as the guy who hates it apparently. And I have been adamant about that, but I would be more willing as to you try. Should. Right. Cause it's trash. Mm-hmm. Like I don't have, I don't have to try. I don't have to eat a piece of dog shit to know it's going to taste like shit. Right. <laughs> so yeah, I would be more willing to try Chicago deep dish for as bad as I think it is. And for as gross as I think it looks like it's a pathetic excuse for pizza. Like, should I eat it with a spoon? How, how Aaron, how would I eat it? With a, with a, um, a fork and a knife or you could right? eat you. Yeah. You don't need to eat it with a fork either. Or I'm sorry, no. with a knife. Yeah, you, you can also eat it. You can also eat it with your hands, with your though. Hands. With your hands, yeah, you could. Um, no, I mean, like it—it's pizza. Like it, it just tastes like pizza. Like people are like, "Oh, it's so disgusting." Like I don't understand why it's got everything that a pizza has. It just looks different. There's just more of everything. Like how could that be bad? It's a pie. I know. Yeah, a pizza, pizza pie. No, no, no. Pizza pie. Know. Pizza, no pie is lingo for pizza. I know that. Like, hey, I'm gonna go get, I'm gonna go get a pie, yeah. But that's like an actual pie. Like you're, like you're eating, you're cutting a piece of a pie. Okay, what's the problem with that? Why does that sound so awful? That's just gross. Like pie, you you associate pie with like. It's dessert. not a pie. No, it's a pizza. Okay, so my feelings on this. Because yeah. this is always what I say is everyone always says that that is Chicago style pizza. It's not Chicago style pizza. You ask any Chicagoan, they will say like, cause what you think about your, your town's pizza, I think is like what you're going to get on a Friday night, you know, with some beer and it's going to be tavern style pizza. Why are you making that face? Zach? <laughs> <laughs> you here? Um, And it's delicious. It's cut into squares with the little corner pieces that are triangles. And it's delicious. That is what I consider Chicago style pizza. That is what I would have every single day day of the week. The only time I ever get deep dish is when someone's from out of town and visiting. Wait, cut into little squares. Like, you mean like like a thin crust type of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Tavern. It's called tavern style here. Oh, I love I love that. Right. That, that is what you can get really, really good tavern style pizza in Chicago. That That is what you ask any actual Chicagoan, they will tell you that that's the pizza that they eat. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll rip that. Right. Off. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's why I hate it with people like Chicago style pizza, deep dish. And I'm like, that's not our pizza. That's just a tourist pizza. I only said that because you and Jacob led into that with Chicago style deep dish. So. Oh, I know. In general, though, if you say it. Yeah. If you say that to the general non-Chicago population, that's what people mean when they say that. The answer to this question is, I am a fat kid, and my favorite style of pizza is edible. I will eat (laughs) any kind of pizza. I don't care. Thin crust, 
thick crust stuff. Stuffed crust is probably my personal favorite. Me too. Me too. You know what? You know what? You know what, Zach? I'm your birthday's coming up. I will send you some Lou Malnati's pizzas. You can send them frozen, and I'll oh. send some out. I see. I've heard Lou Malnati. Uh, my, the, 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 the. Yeah. I heard, I heard they're really good. It's like a yeah. Yeah, I'll send I'll send you some frozen ones. Jacob is saying no. Are they are they bad or something? Or it's like... pretty overrated. But well, I mean, I mean, you'd have to come here in order to get like Pequods or something. Yeah. Oh, Pequod. Damn. Right. Pequod, yeah. Pequod the, the best one. Zach, I've got a spare bedroom. I'll even throw in a cuddle sesh if you want. Wait, I'll who's big spoon? Can we just like share beds or something? Like, doesn't matter. Who's big spoon? Who's little spoon? We'll figure that out when we get here. <laughs> And that's if I said, if he wants, he didn't even say if he wanted or not, I won't go anywhere that I'm not invited, but Zach, you could come here. Pequods is not that far away. It's like a 90 minute car ride, pending traffic. And we'll get some Pequods. Road trip. Blast some, blast some Motley crew yeah. or something. Well, I yeah. hopefully we'll be there too. So what we're going to do then oh, is this is how it's going to work. Zach next year for the game on party that we have, you're going to come down for the, you're going to come here on Friday. Saturday, we're going to go for Pequods. I don't know. We're going to have to do that different Thursday. Friday, we'll go to Pequods. Drive up Saturday for the party. Sunday, go to the Packers game. And then you can fly out of Milwaukee to go back home on Monday. Here we go. That's, Boom. That's not, yeah, that's, that's, that's perfect. All right. So for Packers and Steelers or whatever home game we decide to do next season, depending on when it is. That's perfect. Assuming wow. there are a lot of fans in the stands. Right. Get your shit together, America. I, I always have to throw that little caveat in there, and I hope <laughs> that I have to do that. So please make it so I don't have to keep doing that. But that's where we're at. So that's our heavy hitter segment. The answer to what kind of pizza is the best is edible. And I've had both. I had New York pizza right outside of Yankee Stadium, and that was delicious. Uh, I actually made it to where my uncle stopped the car, and we bought some from a vendor outside because the first piece was so good I wanted another one. And God bless his heart, he stopped and got one for me. So thank you, Uncle Bill, for that. Uh, I had some, I've obviously had Chicago style, thin crust, thick crust, stuffed, stuffed pizza is really good. Um, mm -hmm. I don't really, have just you ever don't... had Chicago pizza grinder? I've never actually had it, but not, it's no. weird. They like serve it. They like put it in. That is, I would argue is more like freaking soup. They put it in like a bowl and then they put the crust on top of the bowl and then they throw it in the oven and then they serve it to you like upside down and they pull the, they pull the bowl off and then it's like, in there. just it's don't like, put fucking pineapple on it that's really all that matters there. so while we're on this topic before we get into game predictions i do want to know so when i talk about bad pizza i mean like chain restaurant fast food kind of pizza so domino's pizza hut papa john's what's Little your guys yeah something like that what's your guys's favorite place for a bad pizza pizza hut 100 yeah. oh god um it's pizza hut jets pizza what the hell is that? You say Jetsons? It's not, it's not Jets, J E T S. It's yeah. The Jets, only Jets, reason Jets. I say that is the only time that I ever get bad pizza is when I'm wasted, and that's like usually open at three a.m. So like every day in Chicago. So, <laughs> so that's the only thing that's open at like three a.m. So come on, it's not every day, Aaron. You're not. Never mind. He's implying that you're drunk every day. Uh -oh. Okay. So one Pizza Hut, two. I'll put Domino's at number two just because their sandwiches are really, really good. And then three, I'll do Little Caesars. Oh, I, I toppers count. Oh, oh toppers. No. Oh, I just saw Jacob's private chat. Never mind. <laughs> I was, yeah, I got it. It took me a second. Um, I, toppers, top toppers be one, but that's that's like only Wisconsin, isn't it? Uh, oh, it's. But I'm telling you, having gone to GB, I. Uh, uh, did you guys watch how I met your mother? Yeah. Okay. There's an episode where they call it the Stinson hangover fixer elixir or something like that. That is toppers pizza. It cured every hangover I could have ever had. And it was fantastic. I loved it. And it was open late when I was drunk. So I think their Buffalo awesome. chicken pizza on point, Buffalo chicken, bacon. It's like chicken wings and bacon on top of a pizza. It's an orgasm in my mouth, a mouthgasm, if you will. Foodgasm is usually what they're called. Hold on. Is that right? I didn't know if that was a thing or not. Mouthgasm okay. makes it sound like your mouth is having. Well, I guess yeah, your mouth is having. Oh, we do have we do have a toppers over here. Oh, yep. Sorry. There you go, Zach. Next time you want some bad pizza, 
that's where you order from. Locally, it's a little, I mean, locally. Well, it's, it's 51 miles away. Am I going to oh 51 man. miles for bad pizza? Yeah, no. No, you don't do that. You drive 51 miles for like Portillo's or something Quads. like that. Pequods. Oh, yeah. Well, I got, see, I got Portillo's like five minutes away. So, I'm so do I now, it. but we I'm used to drive to go to Portillo's. Okay, there was one in DeKalb. We would go to, we would go to Sycamore, which is like 40 minutes away for Portillo's. Jesus. Nobody knows where that is. Sycamore? <laughs> I is know where All I know is away. it's 40 minutes away. Yeah. That's all I, that's all <laughs> okay. I mean. The same area as Northern Illinois University. Home of Kenny Galladay of the Detroit Lions. There you go for everybody listening. So that's the that's the end of that, guys. Thank you if you're still listening. If you're not, I don't blame you at all, guys. Let's get into game predictions here. Packers Bears Sunday, three thirty kickoff uh, at Soldier Field. The mistake by the lake. I call it a litter box because I think that's fitting. I like Green Bay. I think it's thirty-one twenty-one. I think they get out to a lead and kind of coast uh, towards the end there. I just think the defense is rolling. The offense is good enough to put up points. I think they're going to pound the rock at the end. I look forward to seeing how Matt LaFleur uses all three of their running backs, assuming Jamal Williams is able to play. Obviously, Dylan had his coming out party on Sunday, which we regrettably didn't get to. You guys feel free to go on a soliloquy about Quadzilla if you'd like to when I get to your spot here. But I look forward to seeing what they can do on that. Their running game, I know Akeem Hicks didn't play but I don't think he has that dramatic of an effect to where the Packers go from being able to have their way in the running game to not being able to do anything in the running game. I think you'll find that happy medium and they can still throw the ball all over the lot. And it's still Aaron Rodgers, It's still Devontae Adams, still Bobby Tunyon, Alan Lazard. I think you see, you know, MVS is about due for a big one. I think you could see something like that happen too. I look forward to another big game from the offense and the defense does enough. Uh, to kind of win this game. I think it's 31 to 14 at one point. The Bears had a late touchdown for aesthetics purposes. Green Bay wins, clinches that one seed, and gets ready for a showdown eventually against either Mike McCarthy's Dallas Cowboys or the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Zach, and Aaron, I would like to point out as many times as you've made fun of my Dallas Cowboys prediction, uh, mm -hmm. the Cowboys are not going to the Super Bowl. I will say that much, but they do have a chance to make the playoffs <laughs> with a win on Sunday and some help from the Eagles. So you know, anything, anything you know, that happens, right? it's the playoff, baby. You never know. Everybody's Owen, Owen, O going into the playoffs. I will say this. I am rooting so hard for Dallas to make the playoffs and to come to green Bay just because one, I am so certain that green Bay would win that game. Um, the only reason I wouldn't want that to happen, Packer fans are like, they're weird when it comes to Mike McCarthy. It's like the, they've upgraded, right? It's like, we broke up with our, with our ex and we got, we upgraded. Now we have a better, you know, significant other, but we have to keep proving to our ex that we're better off right now. Right. And it's kind of right. weird. And I don't understand that. Like the guy was a really good coach in green Bay and it wasn't, he wasn't at the end. Like, why can't it just be that? But for some weird reason, we have to take a dump on Mike McCarthy at every turn. And I get it. I'm a Mike McCarthy apologist. I'm a Mike McCarthy stand, but I I've talked to the man. I think he's a very special person and I think that he's an easy guy to root for. So I hope he makes the playoffs. And I do think to some degree, even though it's with a losing record, it would be somewhat of a middle finger considering all the stuff that Dallas has gone through this season for them to make the playoffs, but that's beside the point. Um, Green Bay wins 31, 21 Zach, what's your thoughts? My prediction was actually very similar to yours. Uh, when I, when I made it an open book on Wednesday, I had the Packers winning 31, 23. So it'll be within one score in my opinion, but that, that late, that score is going to come late. They're going to come climb, climbing back a little bit. So at some point in the game, Packers are going to distance themselves and, I just think they're going to make life hell for for Mitch Trubisky. You know, I can't I can't see him really having a good day against this defense with the way the safeties are playing, the way Jair Alexander is pretty much shutting down one side of the field and you know, a, a allowing the Packers to pretty much just just operate just just defensively. I mean, you know, it's 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 really it's really been nice to see just that that development and that 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 second year late uh leap that Darnell Savage has, has kind of made too and you know, Matt LaFleur kind of really said it best. He's playing more with his eyes. He's trusting everything in front of him. He's, you know, he's less kind of fidgety, you know, in, in coverage. So, you know, just with the way the whole secondary has been playing, the pass rush is coming alive. You, you're finally, 
trusting your two middle linebackers, whoever it is in there. I mean, they're cycling Christian Kirksey out, who probably had his best game of the season against the Titans. I can't see the Bears doing anything. You know, really, I can't see them walking away with a win. But, of course, anything can happen. Regardless, I see the Packers winning this. It'll be within one score. But, regardless, you're number one seed. Yeah, the Savage thing, I think, is a huge a huge point. And, you know, Aaron mentioned that stuff earlier about the Jair stuff. And I made the point. It was funny on Sunday night. I was like, LOL, you actually targeted Jair Alexander on third down. That was stupid. I saw that tweet. Yeah, right. that was I mean, it's just like whenever they throw the ball near him, I'm just like, why? Like taking a knee was an option. You knew that, right? Like just throw the ball out of bounds. It's the same difference. Right. It's actually probably a better one because Jair could get a hand on it and it could be intercepted. But Aaron, does Jair make you pregnant this weekend? Oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, I, I don't think so because I just, I, they're not going to target him, um, which is fine. Uh, I think I'm going to go. 33 to 19. I'm just trying to figure out a score of Gami. No, 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 no. <laughs> I Kyle Hoffenbecker. I don't think that they get three touchdowns. I just don't. I, I think we're going to smother them. Um, and I think that, you know, one touchdown is going to come in garbage time. I think it's going to be a beat down. Uh, because I think they're going to stick with a similar game plan that they had for the Titans and this offense is even worse than the, than the Titans. So I am not worried about it. So yeah, I, I do think I'm going to make a bold prediction that one of the touchdowns is going to come from our defense or special teams. So. Okay. Let's just calm the fuck down. I right? know. It's <laughs> bold. Maybe they'll give up a touchdown on special teams, but they're not scoring a touchdown on special teams. I will. Oh, I just, I got this, I got this feeling. That's something when we get to draft coverage, I am going to hammer that. I hope the Packers are taking skill players with return ability. Yeah. Just the ability to boost their, because yeah. good God, their special teams yeah. is atrocious. Yeah, I mean, that one's, that one's really bold, but I still think, I, I think there's a possibility that like, I feel like a savage pick six is coming. I just. He dropped one on Sunday. So why not? I know. I just, I and, feel like he's and gotten that drop, he's got increasingly better. That drop was all his, all his eyes. And he had it. Face. He had it. When, yeah. When I, when I. Started I, thinking about I, running I, first and didn't complete it. Yeah. When you go, like when you watch the all 22, just watch him kind of like backtrack and then just kind of like watching the quarterback. And then he made that break. That was just all closing speed. And then if he just hung on to it, it was going to be. Yeah, back. That's that shit that popped off his college tape, man. That's what made me fall in love with him initially. But you're right, Zach. His eyes, you could tell he got like the Nickelodeon football character eyes once he <laughs> saw the ball. It was like, bam. I'm like, I'm going to score. And like, as soon as he dropped it, I was like, six shit. Like, <laughs> man, just make sure you yeah. catch that one, dude. You know what? If you're going to drop him now, you got to save him because in the Super Bowl against Patrick Mahomes, you got to catch him because Pat's going to throw you one or two. Right. You got to make sure you fucking right. catch him. Yeah. You got to make sure you catch those. He'll definitely throw you some. Yeah, he's been doing that all season. And, and Speaking more. of, we didn't get to this, but real quick, yes or no, guys? Aaron Rodgers has the MVP locked up? Yeah. Well, yes. yeah. Plus, plus, Patrick Mahomes, he's not playing in the in the season finale. So, I mean. Right. The only way that Rodgers could lose it is if he throws like five interceptions, and that's not happening. He's never done that, so. Right. <laughs> he's never even thrown four. Yeah, he's right? never done Three, so. I, I'm with you. I, I think that 12 has got it locked up. The only way I could see it is if he has like a clunker, like maybe not five picks, but a bad game. And Josh Allen just lights up Miami, maybe right. that, but even then I just, I can't picture it. I think everything shifted towards Rogers after the last game. And if he plays, even if he has like a 21 for 29, 250 yards, two touchdowns, no picks, green Bay wins like a, a an okay, like a good game, but not a great game. I think, I think it's done. And mm -hmm. Very deserving and his best season by far since 2011, not by far, but his best season since 2011. No question. Mm -hmm. Kudos to 12. We'll congratulate you ahead of time. Now uh, we're very happy, but we got one more MVP award that we certainly, well, I personally don't care if he wins the Super Bowl MVP, but I mean, let's be honest guys. If the Packers win the really? Super Bowl, Rogers will have to like piss all over himself the entire game to not win the MVP. That's just, 
How in which case they're not winning. <laughs> or unless a defensive player has like a really, really amazing game, or maybe two table like six yeah. Yeah. Austin goes like full Desmond Howard. Yeah. Which Dan Kotnick did promise. So he did. yeah. He did. And happy birthday to Dan Kotnick. Yeah. Today's his birthday. Uh the self-described because somebody didn't get it earlier when I brought it up, but the cornucopia of useless crap. That is his description of himself. We love you, Dan, and we appreciate you. I want to also dedicate this show to Mark Eckel. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that uh, in respect for, for him, but I do want to dedicate this to Mark Eckel. Uh, we're thinking about you. And uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the illusion of complexity. Uh, be sure to check us out at game on WI on Twitter. Uh, I am at Jacob Westendorf on Twitter. You can follow Zach at. It's Zachariah J. And you can find him every Wednesday on open book with the incomparable Eli Berkovitz. And of course, a lady who needs no introduction, Erin Alice. You can find her. Uh, at heroin, H-E-R-O-O-I-N-E. And of course, thank you guys for stopping by. Erin does Thirsty Thursdays. So she has that right. coming out today. Check that out. It's Chicago related. And soon enough, I do have my Charles Woodson whiskey. So Aaron, you, myself, and Maggie Loney have promised all of us that we'd get together for an old fashioned and put all that together. So I'm looking forward to being able to do that very soon. Happy new year to everyone that is listening to the show. Thank you that have listened to us all season long Packers bear Sunday, three twenty-five, and a special outro for you today. Must we take this disgrace? Another Bears fan throwing insults in our face. The Packers are the greatest team to ever play the game. Even if from time to time they've been a little lame. How could you ever love a team with Jim McMahon? Not even Porky Pig was as big a ham. They got a reputation that's mostly based on luck. The Bears still suck. The Bears still suck. The bears still suck, the bears still suck, the bears still suck, 